Well, before we move into tonight's teaching, I want to mention what we're going to be doing starting next Thursday. Uh, we are going to be walking through a book called The Three Great Love Commandments. So uh, David took us through Tozer's Pursuit of God. And then now we're going to be spending the next several Thursdays going through this book on what it means to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, loving our neighbor as ourself. But then especially, what does it mean to love Christ's disciples as Christ loved us? The new commandment of the new covenant, which is the third great love commandment. And so the church has purchased this for anyone who would like to read through it. And if you will simply email info at deniachurch.com, then we will drop this by and let us know how many you need for your household. And for those of you who are not able to join us on Thursdays when we begin meeting in person, uh, we still invite you to read along with us, to join us on the live stream that we'll have. But for those of you who can, starting not next Thursday, but the one after, where we hope to begin meeting physically, we'll be going through this book together. And so again, info at deniachurch.com. And we're happy to bring by however many books you need and look forward to going through it together. Uh, tonight, what we're going to talk about is Christian citizenship, or what does it mean for us as American Christians to glorify God as citizens of the United States of America while remaining faithful to our citizenship in heaven? And even more specifically, what does that mean now that we're in election season? And so we're going to start broad talk, talking just generally about what does it mean to be a citizen, and then what does it mean to be a citizen of heaven? Then we'll talk about what does it mean to be a citizen of any nation where God providentially places us, whether that's America, Albania, Armenia, Algeria, or whatever country that God has us living. And then what does it mean to be a citizen of the United States of America? And then most specifically, now that the early voting has started and we're moving towards the November elections, what does it mean to be an American Christian during this election season. So broadly, what does it mean to be a citizen? Uh, the word citizen dates back to around 1300 AD during the Renaissance, where it meant to be a resident of a city, a member of a township. And so this was the time of the great city-states. And one would have your identity, your primarily association with Rome, Florence, Venice, Milan, and not the, the country of Italy. In fact, Italy didn't become a country until 1861. And so back in the days before easy transportation, people's primary identifier was their community, their city, their township. And then this has applications for other political affiliations as well. So when we talk about what it means to be a citizen, there's at least five different components to think about. And one is this idea of community that God is a trinity, that before there was a beginning, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were living together in eternal community with one another. And there was communication, and there was love, and there was delight among these three equally divine persons of the trinity. And when they made men and women in their image, God intended them to be in interpersonal fellowship as husband and wife, and then as families, and then for the families to expand into clans and bands and tribes and communities, and that this was going to be the way that we live our identity is, is an expression of the Trinity in community with other people. And then this also therefore gives us a, a large part of our identity. And so who we are is largely derived from where we came from, where we're attached to. And so uh, I love a t-shirt that I have that just says 76201. And that was the original Denton zip code before there was another zip code. Uh, I was talking to one fellow Dentonite and I said, how long have you been in Denton? And he just said 817-201. And 817 was the original area code before Fort Worth stole it. And there's this idea of, we've been here a long time. And sometimes I'll ask someone who says born and raised Denton. So Flow Hospital, and that doesn't even exist now. Now it's apartments near UNT. But we who are in Denton are proud of our Denton identity as we should be. And likewise, people should be proud of their states, of their countries. And it's not a blind pride, but there's a good patriotism. And that's not, again, blind to its flaws. G.K. Chesterton said, 
that saying my country right or wrong is like saying my mom drunk or sober. It is my mom. And so I'd rather her be sober. And it is my country. And I'd rather her be right. But I'm proud of it, wherever it is. And that's right. And that's good. And that's part of citizenship. And there's also, therefore, this allegiance, not just that I'm part of this community and that gives me an aspect of my identity, but there's a loyalty there. there there's a patriotism there. There's a link and a tie that I want to make that place better and greater. Um, J.K. Chesterton, again, has this delightful novel called The Napoleon of Notting Hill, where he fosters this notion of local patriotism. And this mayor of London begins encouraging all the different neighborhoods and boroughs to have their own flags and have their own anthems and have their own slogans. And there's this local patriotism that then is part of this broader identity as the people of London. And so uh, for those of us who went to Denton, you know, we are proud of being a Denton High Bronco. And then if we're competing with another team, we root for the Broncos against whatever the other team is. But if we're playing outside the state, we root for Texas versus the other state. If it's an international competition, we root for America versus the other nation. And there's this idea of loyalty to where I'm from. And also a loyalty to one another as the fellow members that share this citizenship of this community that gives us this important aspect of our identity. And then that gives us certain rights. Uh, there was an old American Express ad that had the slogan, membership has privileges. And there is this notion of when you're a member of something, when you're a citizen somewhere, that gives you certain rights certain blessings that are part of being an essential aspect of the community and not just a visitor. And then likewise, there are certain responsibilities that come with citizenship. That because I'm part of this community, because I have this allegiance and this loyalty, both to the community and to the people in it, I have certain roles that I play, certain responsibilities that I have. And we work together for the health and the good of the community. And so, Citizenship is this beautiful expression of our being made in the image of God who is triune and who blesses us with the opportunity to live in community and that that is part of who we are. And there is this basic allegiance and it has certain rights and also certain responsibilities. Now, one unique thing about being Christian is that we are all dual citizens of wherever God has providentially placed us. So we are citizens of Canada. America, Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, what have you. But as Christians, we are citizens of heaven. That when we confessed our sins and accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we were brought into the kingdom of heaven. And so Paul will say in Ephesians 2 that for those who know Jesus, we're no longer strangers and aliens, but we're fellow citizens with the saints. He'll tell the Philippians, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there is this commonality that those of us who know Christ share a common allegiance to our King, a common interest in seeking first His kingdom and His righteousness, a common hope of waiting for the King to come back and to establish His kingdom on earth. And so for a Christian, all of our citizenship on earth is a dual citizenship. And our primary identity, our principal allegiance, our ultimate rights and responsibilities are all tied to who we are in Christ. And that trumps any other allegiance and loyalty and link and identity that we have. And so we're going to see on Sunday in Daniel 3 how Nebuchadnezzar is going to build a giant statue, likely inspired by the dream he had. And he's going to require all those involved in government service to bow down before it. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego won't. And they'll be threatened and given a second opportunity to bend the knee. And they'll refuse. And they'll say, even when threatened to be thrown into the fiery furnace, that our God is able to save. But even if he doesn't, we're not bending the knee to you because we only bend the knee to God. Peter will say on behalf of the apostles in Acts 5 when they've been arrested and the Sanhedrin forbids them to speak of Christ any longer. And they said, we must obey God rather than man. That in the org chart, 
God is the King of Kings. He is the Lord over all lords. And so whenever there's a tension or a conflict between an earthly authority and our heavenly authority, we always and ever and only submit to God. So that's our primary identifier, our primary allegiance, our primary loyalty. Uh, there's a gentleman named Thomas More who wrote the book Utopia. He was a servant under King Henry VIII and later lost his head because he would not swear the oath of loyalty to the king that said the king was the head of the church. And his final words before being beheaded were, I die the king's good servant, but God's first. And that perfectly summarizes what it is to be a citizen of heaven first before we're a citizen anywhere else. But we are citizens of the nations where God places us. And so Jesus said, render under Caesar the things that are Caesar. So certain things do belong to Caesar. There are certain responsibilities we have to our earthly sovereigns. And whatever country that is, the Bible gives some general guidance of what our responsibility to our earthly authorities are. So for example, in Romans 13, it says, every person, and no one is above the law or exempt, is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. And those can be plural. There can be the chief executive and then whatever are underneath it. And the reason is there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. And therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath or out of fear, but also for conscience and sake. And so we also pay taxes for rulers or servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. So render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Uh, I remember one time that I was waiting in a car outside a church office where my boss, the missions pastor at the moment, was waiting to hear the elder's decision on a request he had made. And uh, there were three of us in the car waiting on him. And he came out and we said, well, what'd they say? And he said, they said, no. And we were disappointed for him. And he said, no, when I leave that room, I know that I've heard God's will for my life. And I never forgot that of just this right recognition of, in that instance, his spiritual authorities that God had placed over him. And even though he didn't like their decision, even though he disagreed with it, he submitted to it respectfully, honoring them, because that was how he rendered his honor to God. That the way that we show our submission to God is by gladly submitting to the submissions that God places over us. And all of us have some authority, and all of us are under authorities. And the way that we honor God is by exercising that authority for the benefit and the good of others, and then submitting to authorities, because that's also how we show our submission to God. Titus 3 says, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, and to be obedient, ready for every good deed. We pray, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, specifically for kings and all who are in authority. Because when the kings and those in authority are doing their job rightly by God's grace, we lead a tranquil life and a quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Finally, Peter will say, submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Again, whatever we may think of that particular teacher or coach or boss or officer or politician, we're submitting to God, we're submitting to the office, not to the individual. Whether to king as the one in authority, or to governor sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right, for such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, but don't use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, the brothers and sisters in Christ, fear God, and honor the king. So summarizing five things that whatever your nation, whatever your nationality, whatever your country citizenship is, we owe submission and obedience, honor and respect, prayer, taxes, and then we should pursue the general peace, righteousness, prosperity, and justice of our community. 
Uh, we want our nation to thrive. We want our country to prosper. We want flourishing of all our fellow citizens. And Jeremiah 29 summarizes it beautifully. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will have welfare. So this is Jeremiah writing to those who are going to be taken captive by the Babylonians, removed from Israel, forced into a foreign land where they're serving pagan gods, or the nation was. They're in a culture that is ungodly or hostile to Yahweh. And yet, they don't just live in defiance or in isolation. They seek the welfare of the city where God has sent them, even if it's a city in exile. And we pray to the Lord on its behalf. God, let my city thrive. Let my nation prosper. Let my state be healthy. And in its welfare, we have welfare. When our city, when our county, when our state, when our nation is doing well, well, then we also incidentally do well. And so we're vested. We're part of this. Even though we're waiting for the kingdom of heaven to come right now, we're engaged, we're involved, we're trying to be a blessing wherever we're at. We're model citizens. We're trying to be upright and we're trying to seek the good of wherever God has placed us. And whatever nation that is, that's their role as being a citizen of where God has providentially put them. But looking specifically at America, You know, they used to teach civics classes and used to be the government talked a lot about what does it mean to be a citizen, specifically of the United States of America. And so for those of us that it's been a long time or for others that maybe haven't had this, here's what, according to the U.S. Citizenship and Naturalization Services, uh, that government office over citizenship and those becoming citizens of America from another nation. Here's just a few of our rights that we have because God has placed us in the United States of America. The freedom of expression, of speech and of communication, uh, the freedom to worship as we wish, that we have religious liberty that so few nations actually do. We have the right to a prompt, fair trial by jury, to vote in elections for public officials, to apply for federal employment, uh, except for the presidency, where you have to be a natural-born U.S. citizen, the right to run for office, and the freedom to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That with all the negativity about our nation and with all the honesty about its flaws, the reality is we are blessed to live in the country where God has placed us. And very few nations in the history of humanity have enjoyed the affluence and the freedom and the opportunities and the blessings that we have. And so we need to be appreciative of those and mindful of those and on guard to preserve those. But there's also responsibilities that come with our citizenship. One, to support and defend the Constitution. Uh, that is an oath that my wife's family took, that when they became citizens of America, having fled Vietnam, they had to swore to abide by, to support, and to defend the Constitution, that charter document that circumscribes individuals and binds us to the law. Uh, to stay informed of issues affecting our community, that we're not permitted to simply be completely self-absorbed, even though that's all of our tendency. Uh, to participate in the democratic process, that part of our right and therefore our obligation as citizens in a democracy is to be engaged, to be involved, to seek the welfare, not just of ourselves and our families, but of our community, of our city. To respect and obey federal, state, and local laws, that law-abiding citizens are a good thing for that community. To respect the rights, beliefs, and opinions of others because we are a diverse nation made of many peoples from many heritages who have many different viewpoints. And even when we disagree, we can do that without demonizing, without dividing, because we are one nation indivisible. Or participating in our local community whether it's picking up trash on a Saturday, whether it's volunteering at our local elementary school, whether it's getting to know our neighbors, whether it's reaching out to those around us. Again, we want to be a blessing wherever we go, that our neighborhood, our street, our community, 
our local schools are better because we're here and that we've been involved in making it a better place. Paying taxes honestly and on time, serving on our jury when called upon, and defending the country when the need arise. And so these are actually some of the official rights and responsibilities that people entering the country commit to consciously, and those of us born here, born here inherited, even if we're unaware of them. And so in our last point, where we're going to spend most of our time, what does it mean to be an American Christian during an election cycle, during an election season? And obviously, we're in the midst of one now, and we're all eager for it to be behind us. But these things recur regularly. And so it's good to be reminded of how we approach them as both American citizens who are also citizens of heaven. And the first thing is, we should pray to God for our nation. Uh, the welfare of the nation is ultimately in the hands of a sovereign God. And so we pray for him to be merciful to intercede on our behalf, to protect us from our enemies, to protect us from ourselves, to deal and to root out the uh, injustice and unrighteousness in our midst, to make us a unified people, to give wisdom and courage to those in leadership, to raise up people who are going to be good citizens. Uh, in whatever specific crisis we may be in or circumstances we may be in, we pray. A good reminder of this is when you pass a flag, let that be a cue to prompt you to pray. And so whether it's on a lawn or on a federal building or whatever occasion might be, when we're reminded that we are part of this United Nations, let that be a prompt and pray and to say, God, thank you for my country. Thank you for the freedoms and the rights and the benefits that I enjoy. Let me be a good citizen in its midst and let me be faithful in fulfilling the responsibilities that I have as a citizen. And then we begin to pray for those in government office. And we pray for our nation because ultimately its fate and its welfare are in God's hands. Uh, sometimes that prayer is one of confession. Of God, forgive us for being such a wicked nation, for being so fleshly, so absorbed in material things, so divided, so unjust in certain areas. So we ask forgiveness. We give thanksgiving. We intercede on behalf of our country. Secondly, we trust in God with our nation. Um, it's a fearful time. And whether it's economically, whether it's politically, whether it's physically with the pandemic going on, uh, there's many things to be fearful of right now. And so we need to be reminded that our hope is not in the economy not in uh, certain politicians being in office, not in a certain state of health for the nation. Our hope is in God and our trust is in God and that whatever happens in the future with our nation is in God's hand and he is going to preserve his people in its midst. But we can't let our joy, our sense of peace, our well-being be tied to what's coming out on the local news or what's on the front line of the papers. Uh, we can't open the stock market readings every day and let that determine our mood. Uh, I had a good friend that he said, literally, my well-being for the week was dependent on how the Cowboys played on Sunday. And if they won and had a good game, I had a great week. And if they lost and had a bad game, it put me in a funk all week. And then when I became a Christian and started looking at different areas of my life, I thought, how nuts is that? <laughs> my well-being and my joy and the way that I view all of life is tied into a sports franchise, that can't be where our hope and our joy and our meaning are. And so we trust in God with our nation, even as we pray for our nation. Thirdly, we continue to be good citizens of heaven. That's our chief priority. That's our main goal. Isn't how America's doing, isn't how Texas is doing or Denton is doing. Our chief fixation is to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. Uh, we should be eagerly praying for and excited to hear about growth of the kingdom of God overseas. Uh, Bob Palencia called me a couple days ago and said, John, I just got great news from Colombia, and I wanted to share it with you. 
that one of the churches that you met when you were down there with your brother David, that we were supporting during their time of financial need, has been sharing the gospel in the neighborhood. And they've now grown from one service to two services to three services because of all the interest in the community in Christ because of the aid that's being given in a time of need. And Bob was excited. And I was excited. And I don't know these people well. I've met them once. But they're Christians. And they're engaged in God's work. And so that excites me. And I should be engaged in that. Uh, when we read headlines about the persecution of Armenian Christians over south of Turkey, that should concern us. And we should be engaged in prayer and wondering, how are our brothers and sisters doing overseas? Uh, Jonathan Edwards, the American Puritan, used to say that when he read the news or heard news, his ears were always perked to hear what God was doing around the globe because he worshiped a global God who was doing things around the world. And he wanted to find out and that's encouraging, and that's hopeful, and that keeps us mindful of what our primary identity and our ultimate allegiance are, which is to God and his kingdom. And so whatever's going on politically, economically, and in other areas of our earthly existence, that's not what we're living for, and that's not where our primary joys and hopes are. And so we share the gospel. We make disciples. We fellowship with the saints. We assemble as we can. And we enjoy our dual citizenship because it's secure. Fourthly, we continue to be good citizens of America. Uh, whatever's happening in political offices, there's things we can do right now to make our streets and our neighborhoods better places. There's things we can do right now to make Denton a better place to live. There's things we can do this month that would help a child a teacher, an administrator, a family in the Borman Elementary School. And so there's a lot of good to be done. And sometimes we get overwhelmed at the macro and what's happening at the high level, that a lot of good can be done by just simply helping someone out. Uh, I drove by a local church the other day and they had an outdoor event called Fix My Ride. And a bunch of mechanics in the church had come out with their tools and they were doing minor auto repair for free for people who just simply, their car wasn't running well. They couldn't afford to do the mechanical repairs. And so they came in and they just offered a blessing. Uh, Mother Teresa said that the greatest poverty in the world isn't for food or for shelter, but it's for love. And she said, don't worry about doing <clears throat> great things for God. Do small things with great love. And it begins with a smile, that especially today where people are hiding behind masks and fearful of one another, just to simply smile at someone, to offer a word of kindness, encouragement, to inquire how someone's doing, to send a text, an email, a phone call, a visit. Uh, one of the couples in the church was dropping off a pizza box and a restaurant gift card, and it just encouraged the families that were recipients. Um, there are things that we can do right now that pursue the welfare of our city. And whatever's happening in the ballot boxes, we can make our communities better places by being good citizens right now. And then finally, especially in this season, we become informed and we vote because that's one of the privileges and the responsibilities that we have as citizens of a democracy. But how do we begin going about doing that? Um, I wanna offer just 10 <laughs> possible categories to think through as you consider different candidates for different offices. Uh, I'm not gonna mention any names, either of individuals or parties. Uh, one of these is a little bit more personal and I'll share that when it comes. But these are some categories I think through as I begin to approach an election season. And the first question is, what course does the candidate propose to take us on? Now, where do they want the community to go? Because if they're trying to take the country in a direction that I disagree with, I don't care if they're a person of great competence and integrity and very likable. Ultimately, you don't want to get on a plane that's taking you to a destination you don't want to go to. And so the first question to ask before we get to the individual qualifications are, what is this person's plan? What is this party's platform? 
And is that the direction that I think the community needs to go in? And so you can go and read platforms or comparisons of them, but apart from the individual, what's the destination, what's the direction, and is it desirable from my perspective? And then secondly, is this person competent to actually take us there? So if I agree with where they want to take us, do I feel like they have the necessary education, skills, and experience to get us there? And so again, if a particular vehicle is moving in my direction and I don't trust the driver to be able to get me there, I'm not getting in the car. And so there we look at their qualifications. Are they able to do the job? And these aren't just personal, these are also interpersonal. Can they communicate a vision? Can they cooperate and collaborate effectively? Um, are they able to bring others alongside them as they try to get them moving? Can they do the job? A part of that is undoubtedly character. Do they have the proven character to stay the course themselves and to have the credibility to have others go there with them? Um, are they trustworthy or not? Are they wise or foolish? Are they self-serving or are they trying to be civic-minded? Are they short-sighted or are they far-seeing? Again, have they discredited themselves in their history where I wouldn't trust them with our future? Fourthly, who are their confederates? Uh, what party or group or uh, yeah, party or group are they part of? Because a lot of times people don't act individually, they're part of a block. And even if I might like an individual, I need to say, what is the rest of the group that they're partnering with? What is their project? What is the course they have deigned for us? What is their competence and qualifications? What is their character as a group? And so living in a two-party system the way we do, we can't simply evaluate individuals. We have to look at the party that they belong to or the group within the party that they're advocating for. Fifthly, and we should be able to take this for granted, but you can't, which candidate will abide by, strengthen, and defend the Constitution along with the institutions that help others abide by, foster, and defend the Constitution? Now, many of us have enjoyed freedoms for so, <clears throat> for so long, we take them for granted, and we can't. And the reality is that the things that we enjoy the rights that we possess have to be taught to the next generation. They have to be defended. They have to be argued for. Uh, we have to resist the tendency to allow them to fade and to falter or to be undone. And so a very specific question is, who will actually obey the Constitution? Uh, who will uh, appoint judges that will adjudicate the Constitution as, it's, uh, as their office charges them to? versus legislating from the bench. And so we are a country that's based on this charter and we want those who are serving the country to abide by that charter and to foster it and to perpetrate it. Uh, by country, I mean, is the person going to be best for the country as a whole or are they primarily going to be partisan and benefiting a particular demographic or a particular people who have a very specific agenda? or an identity that they're advocating for. And especially at the national level, we want our representatives to represent all of us. And even if they're a state representative, that they're doing so in a way that isn't good just simply for my state, but for the country in which that state is a part, because that's good for my state. That's what's best for the country. And so we're looking for people who don't just benefit my particular interest group, but for those that are in the best interest of the country, uh, for the nation, for all of us, and are going to advocate for that. By clutch, uh, no one knows what the future holds. No one could have predicted the pandemic and the challenges we faced. And so we have to, certain have to trust certain people to act in a crisis. If war breaks out, do I want this person leading our country in a time of warfare? If another pandemic breaks out, do I trust this person to make decisions in the best interest on very limited information? Uh, when crises occur economically, politically, militarily, whatever the case may be, 
is this someone that I trust to be able to make spontaneous decisions with limited information and to not just simply stay popular in the polls, but to lead, to make courageous decisions that need to be made to be decisive. And in a time of crisis, who do I trust? By convictions, does this candidate share my convictions in areas important to me? And this varies a little bit for each one of us. Uh, for Christians, we know that God is the one who knits babies together in the mother's womb. And so we value right to life. Uh, we value the dignity of every human person, whatever their mental capacity, whatever their age, whatever their stage of life. And so we want to vote for candidates as Christians who value Christian convictions on life and right to life. Uh, likewise, on religious freedom, will we have the ability to assemble, to express our faith, to share our faith. And there are times that those are going to be circumscribed if we don't have candidates speaking for us and preserving those uh, constitutional rights. Uh, for others, it may be immigration or the environment. But all of us have certain issues that are especially relevant to us, and important to us, and they're near and dear to our hearts. Whatever those are, is this candidate going to share those and be an advocate for those? By conservative, I don't mean that primarily politically, only secondarily. Uh, a conservative is someone who wants to conserve something, to preserve it and not allow it to be revolutionarily changed, radically altered, or just fade and dissipate through neglect. And so America has much that is worth conserving. And so as a Christian, we look for candidates who conserve American values as an American, biblical values as a Christian, such as uh, liberty and justice for all, that we are a nation built on the idea that all are equal before the law, whether poor or rich, whether coming from an established family or a newly arrived immigrant, that all are equal and all deserve equal opportunity and all deserve justice. And we're not gonna favor one class over another. And everybody has these freedoms and these opportunities and everybody is equal before the eyes of the law. And we have to preserve that because that's precious and that's rare in human history. Uh, limited government, power, funding, and involvement. Uh, America was a federation of states because we believed in individual ownership of property and entrepreneurial spirit and the opportunity for people to go out and to pursue their own idea and not that not everything be directed top down. And so this idea of limited government, in fact, the Ninth Amendment specifically says that all rights not specifically given to the government still belong to the citizens. And so we have always been a grassroots nation as opposed to a state-directed people. And I think that's something we need to preserve. Fiscal responsibility. And again, this is a little bit more personal within compassionate capitalism. That may be a, some discussion now, but at least in my own mind, that's the most just and uh, fair way to lead to an affluent society. Personal freedoms, opportunities, and responsibilities because there's always going to be a threat of censorship and of prohibition and restriction. As Christians, we care about biblical views of gender, sexuality, marriage, and family, because we believe that's not only best for uh, the nation, that the family is the cell of a healthy society, but that's best for those individuals. That if we advocate a biblical sexuality, that's out of love, because that is what God intends for the individual, and that's what's best for them. And we want what's best for them. It's not hateful. It's not bigoted. It's simply an expression that because we know there is a God and God has made us and he's given us the rules by which we thrive and prosper, we want people to abide by those rules so that they will thrive and prosper, even if they don't fully buy into the belief system behind it. A strong defense with secure borders and stable communities, that there needs to be peace, not chaos, order, not anarchy. And then responsible, independent leadership in foreign affairs, that there is a proper place that every head of each nation should be an advocate for that nation, but in a responsible way that's in a good relationship with other nations. And so we are part of this global community, but within that we have individual national interest, and we need someone who's going to be able to represent both those, and they often come in tension. 
And finally, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to a hard choice. All things considered, who is the best candidate or sometimes who's the least egregious candidate? And sometimes we don't like any of our choices, but there's a choice to be made because someone is going to hold that office. And then again, we, with prayerful consideration of these and other factors, say who seems to be the best person or who is the least worst person. Um, I was talking to about someone and describing what it would have been like to be a Christian in the first century Roman Empire if theoretically you had the right to vote. Because the Roman emperors had all power. They were not noble human beings. And there was a particularly probably mad emperor named Caligula, nicknamed Little Boots because of his small feet, who when uh, the English Channel thwarted him in his attempt to invade England, ordered his soldiers to punish the waves by smiting it with their weapons. Uh, he was notorious in his morality. He was a profligate, not a good person. But his successor was Nero, who, according to history or anecdote, fiddled while Rome burned and then blamed it on the Christians and persecuted them and lit his garden parties by lighting Christians on fire. And neither one of those is someone you want ruling your country. Neither one of those is someone that you want to point your kids to and say, that's who you want to be when you grow up. But if I had to choose between the two, at least Caligula wasn't martyring Christians by feeding them to the lions and setting them on fire. And that was the least bad choice in that time if I was a Christian in Rome at that time. And sometimes we're left there. It's been a tough season, and it's been a discouraging one. And so in the midst of it, let's remember what it means to be a citizen, a part of a community, that this is part of the identity that God has providentially prescribed for us. And therefore, we give it our allegiance and our loyalty. We enjoy its rights, and we take on its responsibilities. We remember that we are first and foremost citizens of heaven, that our principal identity isn't American or Canadian or Mexican or any other nationality. We are God's children, and we identify with God's children around the world, whoever they are. And our chief goals are for the coming and the extending of the kingdom of heaven. Our values are heavenly. Our rules are heavenly. Our book is the Bible over the Constitution. And that's primarily the citizenship that we live in. But within our country, we are going to be submissive to governing authorities because they have been established by God unless they try to require us to do something that God prohibits or prohibit us from doing something that God requires. And then we must obey God rather than men. We show them honor and respect, even if we disagree. We pay our taxes, we pray for them, and we strive for the good of our communities. Now, probably all of us could become more knowledgeable of what it means to be a citizen of the United States. Uh, we need to periodically read the Bill of Rights to understand what our rights are and to make sure that they aren't being forfeited or squandered or marginalized. We need to realize what our responsibilities are and to be willing to assume them even when our natural tendency is to be caught up in our own existence and our own family affairs. And then during election seasons, and they're going to come regularly, we first of all pray for our nation. And again, seeing a flag would be a good occasion to just pray for our leaders, pray for our country. We trust in God with our country, that when we thrive, we trust God and praise him. Uh, when we struggle, we trust God and praise him. And whatever he has for our country, our ultimate faith and trust is in God and not in the particular circumstances of that country. We continue to be good citizens of heaven, good citizens of America, and then we get informed and we vote. Oftentimes, most times, that's not going to be an ideal candidate. And so some of us may actually need to be willing to consider becoming a candidate or encouraging other good candidates to run. And that's a tremendous challenge. Uh, that's a tremendous sacrifice. But it's something that we undertake for the love of our country. I was watching some of the hearings of Judge Barrett, and one of the senators said, why would you be willing to subjugate yourself to what you knew was coming both on the front end and likely on the back end if you were nominated as a Supreme Court justice? 
And she said, you know, my son was deeply upset yesterday at some of the things that were said during the hearing. And I had to go and talk to my family about why mommy was doing this. And at the end of the day, it's because I love my country and I believe in my country and I'm willing to sacrifice and to put myself at risk if I can do some good to preserve her. And that's right. And that's noble and that's honorable. And that's something that we should do in pursuing the welfare of our city. Uh, whether these are exactly the categories you use or if you agree with every part of them, uh, have some category. Don't just vote on gut or on what mailer hits your box, positive or negative, that turns you for or against a candidate. Don't buy into whatever media channel may be sending. We need criteria to make wise, informed, prayerful choices. And sometimes they're not the best choice or the ideal choice, but we have to make a choice and we do the best we can and trust God with the results. And so looking forward to turning next week to focusing on what we do in election seasons and out in whatever citizenship, whatever community we're a part of, chiefly we are to be concerned with loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength of loving our neighbors as ourselves, and loving one another as Christ loved us. And as long as we focus on that and pursue that and enjoy that, then it's going to be okay. And whatever we may go through in our particular communities. Would you pray with me? Father, we again thank you that you have made us to exist in community. That you are a, a God who exists as community, Father, Son, and Spirit. And you made us with personhood so that we could have interpersonal relationships with you and with others. And you intended a man and a woman to become a husband and a wife, to become a father and a mother, and for the children to grow and then to take on families of their own, and for families to become clans and communities and cities and tribes and nations and civilizations. And that's a good thing. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. And we do pray that you would help us balance our dual citizenship as members of your kingdom and members of whatever country that you have providentially caused us to be born in or to have migrated to, we pray that we would be faithful. We pray that we would be uh, seeking the good of our earthly kingdom, even while we ultimately pursue first the coming of the heavenly kingdom. And we pray for our nation in this election season, in this coming three weeks. We pray for righteousness to prevail. We pray for truth to prevail. We pray for people to make wise, righteous decisions. We pray your mercy upon our nation. We pray for her to be righteous and just. We pray for her to be healthy and strong, that she might be a blessing to other nations around the world as well. But let your church be light. Let your people be salt. And let us model you and uh, represent you well in whatever communities you place us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.